Okay, so it looks like it's about time to start. Um, so yesterday, I pro yesterday, last time I promised you that today we'd take a look uh, at some proofs. In particular, I promised that I would do the proof of the non-vanishing theorem and give you a hint towards the base point free theorem that are important ingredients in the proof of the cone theorem. Uh, and so I, I intend to follow through. So before I get started with the proof of the non-vanishing theorem, I need to tell you about the main tool. Um, which is not just the main tool for proving the non-vanishing theorem, but in all of this uh, minimal model program stuff, and that's kavamata vivek vanishing. So probably everybody's familiar with old-fashioned Kodaira vanishing. So with Kodaira vanishing, we consider X a smooth complex projective variety, since all varieties are complex projective in these talks, I'll just say smooth, and we consider A an ample line bundle or Cartier divisor. And then we have vanishing of higher commodity groups, Hi of omega x tensor A is equal to zero for every i greater than zero. So, as you know, ample just means that a, a tensor power of A is very ample, defines an embedding in projective space. Now, the downside, what we don't like, is that ampleness is not well behaved from a rational point of view. Is not well behaved rationally. So Kodaira vanishing statement turns out to be not so useful from our point of view. So what happens, for example, if you consider a rational morphism, like uh, you know, a log resolution of some linear series or something, uh, and you pull back A, this is no longer ample because the intersection with C will be 0 for any exceptional curve. Nevertheless, what it will be true is that uh, uh, the pullback of A will retain some positivity properties. So the pullback of A is nef and big. So let me first remind you uh, what nef and big means. So uh, let's say M in general, it could be, let's say Q cut here. Maybe even R cut here if you prefer. Some of these things you have to state slightly differently. So M Q cut here is nef, as you well know, as we mentioned before, if the intersection with any curve is always not negative for any C in X curve. Now, um, I think I've also mentioned, but there are, let me uh, mention it again, there are several different uh, characterization of the bigness property. So, uh, um, we have to choose which, which one we prefer. So I think the most standard is uh, if you look at the limb soup of H0 of, of the number of sections of multiples of M uh, divided by K to the D, where D dem denotes the dimension of X. So I look at this limb soup, and this is equal to, uh, well, is non-zero, which means it's positive. Okay, so, so if, if you think of uh, this, uh, the dimension of these vector spaces as, as behaving like a polynomial, then you want this polynomial to have maximal degree. Uh, and it's well known that this is equivalent to saying that the actual limit of H0 km over k to the d is non-zero, but it's going to be positive. And uh, maybe the other de definition I gave was that the Kodaira dimension of m is equal to uh, d, where d is the dimension of x. And maybe another definition I might have alluded to is that m has to be q linear equivalent to an ample divisor plus an effective divisor. So a is ample and E is an effective Q device. So these are all equivalent definitions of, uh, of bigness. Uh, but in the case where M is nef, so if we assume that M is nef, then M is 
big if and only if uh, the top self intersection of M is strictly positive. OK, so some of the implications are easy to see, some are a little harder to see. Uh, but, you know, for example, if you have lots and lots of sections of multiples of Km, you can consider the map from Km to the restriction to some very ample divisor. Think of A as being a hyperplane class. Now, the number of sections of this line bundle is bounded from above by a constant times k to the dimension d minus 1, because the dimension of A is just d minus 1. If you're assuming that m is big, then this number of sections is greater or equal to a different constant times k to the d. So this map at the level of h0, so in other words, h0 of k m to h0 of k m restricted to a has a kernel, has a non-trivial kernel, and hence you get a section of km vanishing along a. Well, that's, you can read off this statement from that. Uh, so it's not, it's not very diffi di difficult, but definitely time consuming to show that all of these statements are equivalent. So I am, uh, I'm not going to uh, get into that. What I would like to emphasize is that it's easy to check. So if M is Nefan big, then it is now clear that the pullback of M is Nefan big. Nefness, you just check by the projection formula. And uh, uh, bigness, uh, for example, once you know it's Nef, you can, the top self intersection number is also not changing. Right? So f of the star of m to the d is the same as m to the d, which is positive. OK, so net and bigness is a property that has behaved well under birational uh, maps. And so uh, um, when I say Kavamata Vivek vanishing, you'll see that it's uh, um, much uh, better behaved uh, for birational geometry. So Kavamata Vivek. Uh, I feel like I'm missing an H. I'll be there. Vanishing. So in this vanishing, um, let's start with X is smooth, but I'll generalize it very quickly to uh, the KLT pair situation. L is a Cartier divisor. And I'm going to assume that L is numerically equivalent to uh, the canonical class of X plus uh, B plus M, where um, M is Nefan big, and B has simple normal crossings with the property that the round down of B is equal to zero. So I don't know if I've told you what the round down is, but let me sort of uh, uh, remind you what this means. This, the, you're simply taking, you view B as a sum of coefficients times prime divisor, and the round down of this is given by the sum, you round down each individual coefficient, assuming that the prime divisors are distinct, right? So you're just taking the biggest integer, which is less or equal to these numbers. So the round down equal to 0, this condition is equivalent to saying that the coefficients are somewhere between 1 and 0. OK, so under these hypotheses, then we get vanishing of higher cohomology groups. Okay, so so uh, now Kavamata Vivek vanishing is much more flexible from a couple of points of view. If you set B equals zero, it's just like Kodara vanishing, but I'm allowing net and bigness instead of ampleness, so something that behaves very well under birational maps. Uh, but also, I'm allowed to um, fudge things by simple normal crossing divisors with small coefficients. OK, so um, this is not the ultimate form that you want for Kavamata Vivek vanishing. In fact, you want a version of this that works for singular varieties, for KLT varieties, 
and uh, you also want a relative version for this. So let me uh, do a quick introduction to this. So what uh, do I mean by relative version? Relative Kavamata Viveg vanishing. Well, instead of considering a projective variety, you consider projective morphisms of varieties and so on. So let's say that L is Cartier. For simplicity, let me assume that X is projective, but you just need a projective morphism. X projective. Uh, we are going to uh, have a projective morphism from X to Y. Morphism. And I'm going to assume that L is numeric equivalent to KX plus B plus M again. So L is Cartier, but B and M are Q divisors. And uh, let, me, um, let me work my way up to the singular case. So for now, I'm going to assume that B has simple normal crossings. The round down of B is 0. But now um, M is just F nef and F big. And then the conclusion is that the higher direct images of L uh, are 0 for every i greater than 0. So I should say that if we take uh, y just to be spec c, so this is just a structure map, then uh, the relative Kavamata Vivek vanishing is the same as the usual Kavamata Vivek vanishing. Right? Because then instead of having a projective morphism, you just have a projective variety. The F nef and F big conditions become just nef and big. And this push forward just corresponds to uh, the corresponding cohomology group. OK, so what does F nef and F big mean? So for example, F nef means that when I take M and I intersect with C, I always get a non-negative number, provided that uh, C is a curve which is contained in a fiber of F. In other words, F lower star of C is 0. So it has non-negative intersection with vertical curves. And the bigness, well, you can phrase it in a couple of different ways. One way to phrase it is that the top self-intersection of M restricted to a general fiber is positive. Okay, so, um, so maybe since it's very easy, maybe let me show you that uh, the relative version of Kavamata Fivek vanishing implies, uh, sorry, is implied. So the usual version implies the relative version. OK, so uh, this is very easy. So let's um, fix H sufficiently ample uh, Cartier divisor on Y. Uh, then I claim that I can assume that higher cohomologies of uh, push forwards of L twisted by H are equal to 0. This is by sur vanishing, right? This we have uh, at most dimension of x values for which this sheaf is non zero. And for each one of these, if I, if I twist by a sufficiently ample uh, line bundle, the corresponding higher cohomology groups will vanish by just by sur vanishing. And uh, I can also assume that these sheaves, once I twist them with this sufficiently ample vector bundle, are generated. So the global sections generate the stalks at every point. OK. Um, now, the other observation I want to make is that m plus the pullback of h uh, is I can assume that this is nef and big. Now, I don't think that this is completely obvious, right? So 
for a, suppose that there's a curve that intersects M negatively, that curve cannot be vertical. So its image on Y is another curve, which will intersect H positively. If H is sufficiently ample, that intersection number grows. Eventually, this number becomes positive. Somehow, you have to show that that happens uniformly for all curves. So it doesn't seem completely obvious to me. Uh, the easiest way to me is to think that Neff is in the closure of the ample cone, but maybe there's some other easier trick. So I'm not proving that. I'm just uh, reminding ourselves that this fact is true. Okay? Uh, the, the bigness is going to be easier to check uh, because you can sort of reduce it to a statement about the intersection of the general fiber. Okay, so let's assume that this is true. Uh, then what does that tell us? Well, the usual Kavamata Vivek vanishing says uh, that uh, the higher cohomology groups, uh, let me use different indices because I don't know which one I want to compare, of L tends to the pullback of H will now be equal to zero for every K greater than zero. But now, higher cohomologies of any push forward vanish. And so, by a spectral sequence argument, it, the spectral sequence degenerates. So, by an easy argument, these cohomology groups are actually computed by H0 of Rk, F low star of L, tensor H. So, I'm using two things here. I'm using the projection formula to say that the k push forward of this sheaf is this sheaf. So sort of the h came out, pull back, push forward of h, and just give me h there. And I'm using this uh, since all of these higher cohomology groups vanish. I'm using an, a spectral sequence argument. Well, you don't even need a whole spectral sequence argument to identify these cohomology groups here. OK, so I know that this cohomology group vanishes. However, so maybe, maybe let me call this this condition A and this condition B. So here I use condition A. Now I'm going to use condition B. I know that these sheaves are globally generated, but they have no sections. So the only way that the sheaf can have no sections and be globally generated is if that sheaf is 0. And now H is an invertible line bundle. It's a line bundle, so it's an invertible sheaf. So this being 0 is, of course, telling you that the push forward of L is equal to 0, which is what I wanted to show. Okay? So, so I'm just trying to make the point that uh, the, the traditional form of Kavamata Vivek vanishing almost automatically, formally, implies the relative version of Kavamata Vivek vanishing. Any question? OK, so probably you've seen some variant of this argument before. Um, uh, maybe more interesting for our purposes, it brings us close to the computations we'll be doing in a minute, is the KLT version of Kavamata Vivek vanishing. So let me call this KLT Kavamata Vivek vanishing. So in this scenario, I um, no longer have a smooth variety. So I have. L will be cut here. Uh, yes. Sure. So, a uh, couple of things. Uh, relative power of your function, why are you assuming F itself is closure? For my, uh, so that I can cheat and make my life easier, because otherwise, if I want to do this proof, if I want to rely on the usual Kavamata Vivek vanishing, I need to take my projective morphism and I need to compactify it. Okay. However, it's not clear that when I compactify it, I get a smooth variety, so I can't directly apply Kavamata Vivek. So I'd need to take a resolution. And to do that, I would need to conflate the two arguments that I'm trying to keep separate to make it easy. So then, uh, you can assume why it's closure um, I meant to say a morphism of projective varieties. But you don't have to assume that Y is projective. All yeah, you need. Well, I am a, I am implicitly assuming that Y is projective here to do this proof. I see. Yeah, that that's what I'm doing. But you don't need to assume that Y is projective. Ah, you, okay. 
with a lit combining these two arguments that I can sketch, you can easily show it just for us. Other questions? Yeah, so, so, yeah. so it was just a matter of convenience so that the, this argument would be nice and short. OK, so, um, okay, so now I'm trying to state a version on a, for a KLT pair. So let me introduce my KLT pair. So XB uh, a KLT pair. So when I say KLT pair, I mean that the coefficients of B are going to be between 0 and 1. I'm not allowing negative coefficients, and I'm not allowing 1 as a coefficient. And let's assume that L, this Cartier divisor, is numerically equivalent to Kx plus B plus M, uh, where M is nef and big. So again, I don't actually need to assume that it's Cartier. I could more generally assume that it's integral vowel divisor, but then the proof that I'm going to do would be a little bit harder, a little bit more confusing, and I uh, don't think I need to use that more general statement. OK, so I need a conclusion. And the conclusion, of course, is going to be vanishing. High homologies of L vanish for every i greater than 0. OK, so let's look at the proof. So by proof, I mean I'm going to use the usual cover matta Vivek vanishing to, or, and the relative version to prove this statement. I'm not going to prove cover matta Vivek vanishing from scratch. So. Um, what do I do? I consider, well, the previous statements are in terms of smooth varieties. So let me uh, rewrite everything on a log resolution. So f from x prime to x is a log resolution. And as usual, I'll write kx prime plus b prime to be the pullback of kx plus b. Then if I look at the pullback of L minus kx prime plus b prime, well, of course, this is just a pullback of L minus kx minus b. And by assumption, uh, uh, this is, um, OK, let's write it, numerically equivalent to the pullback of m, which is nef and big. OK, so, so from this, I can, I, I, I will have a vanishing statement upstairs. So um, let me consider now the pullback of L minus the round down of B prime. So that will be numerically equivalent to Kx prime plus B prime minus the round down of B prime uh, um, plus the pullback of m. So let's, let's check my computation. Um, so the pullback of L is the pullback of m plus kx prime plus b prime. The pullback of L is the pullback of m plus kx prime plus b prime. And then I have this as minus b prime on both sides. So I didn't cheat. I didn't make a mistake. Now let me focus on this part here. And let me notice that this part here is just so this is a new symbol, the fractional part of B prime. You're taking the coefficients of B prime and subtracting off the, the int the round down. So all you're left is with the fractional part. And so that's a fractional divisor with simple normal crossings because I'm on a log resolution. This is a nef and big divisor. So um, Kavamata Vivek vanishing applies to this Cartier divisor, pullback of L minus round down of B prime. So what does that tell me? The relative version says that higher direct images of the pullback of L minus the round down of B prime have to vanish for every i greater than 0. So this is applying Kavamata Vivek vanishing in the smooth setting to the morphism uh, from x prime to x. Now, let me also apply it to the morphism from x prime to spec C, in which case I get that h, uh, I don't know, let's call it hk 
of f of a star of L minus the round down of B prime is equal to zero for every k greater than zero. But now you see, since higher direct images of this gadget vanish, then this is the same as hk of f lower star f upper star l minus the round down of b prime. And we're almost there. Right, so this is the usual spectral sequence argument. We're using this fact there. And we're also there, so almost there, because I, now I need to observe, OK, by the projection formula, this is L was a Cartier divisor. So this is L my tensor by the push forward of OX prime minus the round down of B prime. And now I'm a little bit worried because what did I promise you? I would promise you a new vanishing of high commodity of L. I'm getting vanishing of high commodity of L twisted by this obnoxious gadget. OK, but let's think about So I really want this to be equal to O of x. And then I can declare that I win, right? The, the, the proof is over. So why, why could that be? Well, let's think about what this round down of b prime looks like, right? So I haven't used the condition that xb is klt yet. So xb being klt means precisely, is actually equivalent to saying that the round down of b prime, so when I pull back, I get coefficients that are strictly less than 1. In other words, the round down of b prime is less or equal to 0, which is the same as saying that minus the round down of b prime is an effective divisor. And of course, it's exceptional. So this is an effective and exceptional divisor. So this equality is true. Right, so this is just due to the fact that minus the round down of b prime is effective and exceptional. And that concludes the proof. Okay. So then I guess I should state this in a sort of relative version for Kavamatha log terminal pairs, but I think I think we, we sort of get the picture. Um, okay, so uh, t this turns out to be a very versatile and extremely useful kind of statement. Uh, you know, the, um, what are the kinds of things that you can do with vanishings? Well, one thing is, you know, suppose that you know that you have, uh, uh, you have x and you have a, a smooth divisor y in x then you can consider the short exact sequence kx plus l to kx plus y plus l to ky plus l to 0. Now, if you know that h1 of uh, kx plus l is equal to 0, if you have banishing for this gadget, then you get that h0 of kx plus y plus l subjects onto h0 of ky plus l. So you can lift sections from a divisor to the ambient variety. Now, the trick is to find some interesting situation where you can arrange this. Okay? So that's a typical thing that you use vanishing for, is to lift sections from a divisor to the ambient variety, and so hopefully to do proofs by induction on the dimension. Right? You'd like to prove things in any dimension, then you need some way to go down by one in dimension. And typically, this is how you do it. So a junction, kx plus y becomes ky. And that sort of looks like inductively the right thing to do. And you're going down in dimension by one. Uh, another thing that vanishing theorems allow you to do is produce sections of a line bundle. And again, this is going to be a very simple-minded. And next, I'll do a very sophisticated version. So the very simple-minded version is you know, if x is smooth, L is ample, then you have that hi of kx plus L to the tensor m is equal to 0 for every i greater than 0 and m greater than 0, right? Because if L is ample, 2L is ample, 3L is ample, and so on. Uh -huh. So then that tells you that h0, the dimension of the space kx plus L to the tensor m, is the same as the Euler characteristic. And by riemann roch this is a polynomial 
of degree equal to the dimension. And in particular, it's a non-zero polynomial, right? The leading coefficient is the top self-intersection of L, maybe divided by d factorial. Uh, I don't remember my Riemann rock precisely enough. Um, OK, so that says that if you look at, so that, that tells you immediately, so a polynomial of degree d cannot have d plus 1 zeros, a non-zero polynomial of degree d. So that tells you immediately that h0 kx uh, plus l to the k is non-zero for some k in the interval between 1 all the way up to d plus 2. If they were all zero, then I have a polynomial of degree d with d plus 1 zeros. It has to be the zero polynomial, but it's not the zero polynomial contradiction. OK, so I don't think you get anything interesting from these simple-minded applications. But the, the next very interesting application is um, somewhat in the same spirit, just requires a little bit more work. So I already stated the, the theorem, but let me state it again. So it's the non-vanishing theorem. So I'm going to assume that xb is a projective sub-KLT pair. So remember, the sub-KLT means I'm allowing negative coefficient. If that bothers you for now, think that it's not sub KLT, just think of a regular KLT pair, but in a second you'll see why I want to allow this freedom. It just, it just makes the proof easier to work in this more general context. D is going to be a NEF divisor. Um, NEF Cartier. Sorry, sorry, yes. Why would you plus two? Is that one? Where, where's the, oh, D plus two, because I wanted D plus one. Ah, oh, yeah, I don't need D plus two. Just to be on the safe side. <laughs> Certainly true with d plus 2, yeah. Yeah, so if you have d plus 2 zeros, imagine. OK, d, nef, and Cartier. Uh, a, d minus kx plus b. This one, I'm going to make a strong hypothesis, nef plus big. And this bigness is uh, essential here. And a is greater than 0. Then the conclusion is that H0 of MD minus the round down of B is non-zero. So this is the non-vanishing. We have sections in uh, this divisor. And now remember, OK, sub KLT means that the coefficients are less than 1. So the round down of B is less or equal to 0. So minus the round down of B is some effective divisor. OK, so, so if you put, oh, I haven't written the statement. If you put m equals 0, this statement would be obvious. But that's not what we want to think about. We want to think about this being true for all, for all m integers which are sufficiently big. OK. So I'm going to start with a couple of reductions. So the first reduction is sort of a trivial reduction. So I'll call it step zero. Improving the theorem, we may assume uh, that x is smooth uh, and ad minus kx plus b is ample. OK, so how can you assume that x is smooth? Well, you pass to a log resolution and show that it's enough to prove the statement on the log resolution. So we'll consider a log resolution, x prime to x. Uh, we'll consider the d prime just to be the pullback of d. Of course, if d is nef and Cartier, its pullback is again nef and Cartier. And kx prime plus b prime will be the pullback of kx plus b. And so if this is K, sub klt, then this is also sub klt. And notice that even if you started with an honest klt pair, 
when you go to a log resolution, you will get some negative coefficients typically, so you cannot assume it's any more KLT. The sub KLT is sort of the natural condition to put in there. Okay, now if I look at A D prime minus uh, K X prime plus D prime, this is just the pullback of A D minus K X plus B. So pullback of Nefan big is again Nefan big. And let me use this property that it's Nefan big. So I can write it as being Q linear equivalent to an ample divisor plus an effective divisor. Uh, Q divisors, of course. Okay. So now I am going to uh, write. So, so essentially, I've already showed you that I can assume that X is smooth. But where is this ampleness coming from? Well, somehow I have to eke the ampleness out of from this factor here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change my boundary ever so slightly. So let me consider the following. Let's look at a d prime minus k x prime uh, plus b prime plus epsilon f. Okay, so you should think of this as perturbing the boundary b prime by uh, a very small multiple of this effective divisor. So this will be q linear equivalent to 1 minus epsilon a d prime minus kx prime plus b prime plus epsilon a. And this is ample, right? Because this divisor is a non-zero multiple of something nefan big. So it's, again, a nefan big divisor. This is an ample divisor. Ample plus nefan big is automatically ample. I should say we d definitely need to assume that epsilon is greater than 0 if we want this to be ample. But we also want. Um, um, we also want uh, the pair x prime, b prime plus epsilon f. We would like to, this one to be uh, KLT uh, and sub KLT. Okay, and that uh, is clearly going to be true because the, uh, essentially, you're asking for the coefficients to be strictly less than 1. These coefficients are strictly less than 1, so that's an open condition. If I put arbitrary small uh, value of epsilon, it will still be sub, sub KLT. So I want to assume that epsilon is sufficiently small to preserve the sub KLT uh, question. This, uh, so now, if I'm assuming that the statement is true on a smooth variety, when this difference is ample, then uh, you see the difference is ample. The pair is sub KLT. So my conclusion here would be, so I can assume that H0 of M B prime minus the round down of B prime plus epsilon F is non-zero. And then I simply observe that if I push, if I take this, a section in here and I push it forward, I get a section of MD minus the round down of B. Uh, so we need to think about this for just a second. So the push forward of D prime is D, just because by definition D prime is a pullback of D. So no issue there. Uh, how about the push forward of this gadget? Well, we know that the push forward of B prime is B. Now, could this epsilon F ruin the day, right? Well, the only way that it would ruin the day is if by adding this epsilon F, I'm increasing some coefficient to be uh, bigger than the next integer, right? But since I'm assuming that epsilon is sufficiently small, I can assume that this round down is actually equal to the round down of B prime, and so the push for this minus the round down of B. And so that, uh, uh, that concludes the first reduction. So any questions so far, either on the statement or on this first reduction? And the first reduction is more psychological than anything. Now, the next one is an honest, serious step. It's easy, but it, it it gets the, the bull rolling. 
So in this step, we may assume that d is not numerically equivalent to 0, right? Um, so somehow the case d numerically equivalent to 0 is problematic. Again, my favorite example is a non-torsion line bundle on an abelian variety. Some line bundle such that no tensor power is a trivial line bundle. Those line bundles, no matter what multiple you take, you never get a section, right? And on an abelian variety, you could take b equals 0, and kx is just a trivial thing. So then you would get that ad minus kx plus b is just numerically trivial. So it's nef, it's not big. So that's why I'm saying that the bigness is absolutely essential, because that's a counterexample. On an abelian variety, most degree 0 line bundles are a counterexample. OK, so, so let's, let's, let's use this bigness condition. Um, so for every k integers k and t in z, I can think of kd minus the round down of b. Uh, OK, I said I may assume that this is not numerically 0. OK, so, so if it is numerically 0, I'll solve the problem. Let's see. Uh, so let's look at this. Um, this is, OK, maybe I'll write it. So assume d is numerically 0. So in that case, this will be numerically equivalent to kx plus the fractional part of b plus t d minus kx plus b. OK, so um, when I look at this guy here, uh, this is ample. Well, because by the previous reduction, AD minus kx plus b is ample, but AD is numerically trivial, so minus kx plus b is ample. Td is numerically trivial. I only care about minus kx plus b. So this gadget here is ample. Yeah, so I'm, I'm just saying that this case, you have a lot going for you. Every divisor you write is essentially plus or minus kx plus b, and so it's plus or minus ample. Yes, numerically equivalent, correct. Right, and you know, somehow we're trying to go from numerically equivalent to linearly equivalent to zero. So here, here, here is the magic. So what can I say? I can say that h0 of md minus round down of b, this is where I really want my section to be. I want this group to be non-zero. This is, well, uh, OK, put m equals k, then you've written it as a KLT gadget plus an ample divisor. So you have vanishing of higher cohomology groups. So h0 is equal to the Euler characteristic. But now the Euler characteristic is determined by a polynomial, which only depends on the numerical class of d, so um, on the numerical class of, of this, and the numerical class of d is 0. So this is the same as the Euler characteristic of minus the round down of b. And by the same argument, higher cohomologies of this vanish. So this is equal to h0 of minus the round down of b. And now somewhere, I hope I've written that minus the round down of b is effective. Uh, well, I did mention it at some point, right? Because it's KLT, that's essentially equivalent to a condition of being KLT. So this is non-zero as minus the round down of B is effective. Second line. Second line. Great. I knew I had it somewhere. Yes. OK. So that concludes this case. OK. OK, so now I know that d is not numerically equivalent to 0. I'm going to use that uh, to create some interesting 
sections, not of D itself, but there'll be, uh, well, maybe I should just write the statement. So let's pick a point which is on X, but let's assume that it's not in the support of B. Just pick a general point on your variety. And uh, I claim that there exists an integer Q0 such that for every Q greater or equal to Q0, there exists a Q divisor. Yes. Ah, ah, by the same reason. So, so from here to here, cover matter Vivek vanishing, right? Yeah. It's the same vanishing from here to here because you see. No, 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 no. Okay, look at this line here. So, this is what I called L previously, my Cartier divisor. Uh, okay, so that's numerically equivalent to a KLT pair plus an FM big guy. So I have ha vanishing of higher cohomology groups. So here, I'm applying it with K equals M, that I have vanishing of higher cohomology groups. And here, I'm applying it with K equals 0. I've been there. The first time you see this, you just get confused because D is there, but it disappears. And it, it's, uh, but that's what what's makes that step work. And what makes the next step work is precisely that D is not numerically equivalent to zero. So let me let me finish writing what the statement is. So I'm I'm claiming that I'm going to produce an interesting divisor, this MQ. Uh, so it's going to be a divisor which is numerically equivalent to QD minus KX plus B. So, so I'm supposed to produce divisors which are linear equivalent to a multiple of D. I'm not quite doing that. And I'm producing Q divisors. So it's, it's, not, it's not what I want. Uh, it's essentially an asymptotic version of what I want. And so this divisor M, depending on Q, will be the linear equivalent to QD minus KX plus B. And it will have the property that the multiplicity at this randomly chosen point x is greater, let's say strictly greater than twice the dimension of x. OK, so, uh, okay, so let's prove this. So um, essentially, if you're familiar to this kind of argument, what you need to do is you need to show that this is a big divisor. It, multiples of that have lots of sections. So let me let me do that. Okay. So um, first, I claim suppose that A is ample. Then D times A to the D minus one is non-zero. The reason for this is simply that D is not numerically equivalent to zero. So there has to be some curve that intersects D non-negatively. If I pick A sufficiently ample, I can assume that this intersection contains that curve plus other curves. But since D is also an F, then this intersection will be strictly positive. So if you think about it for a second, that's easy to see. So this is just because D is not numerically equivalent to 0. And uh, since D is an F, any power of D intersect with the complementary power of A will always be non-negative. So when I look at this intersection number, QD minus KX minus B to the D, this is Q minus AD plus AD minus KX minus B to the D, which is greater or equal. So uh, let me write it down and then comment. goes to infinity. OK, let's look at what I've written. OK, so I picked this divisor. This is, I want to produce sections that are numerically equivalent to that. There will be actually Q linear equivalent, but doesn't matter. OK, we look at this guy. I take the dif power. So I'm going to split it up into two parts. I'm going to split it up into AD minus KX plus B. This is my ample guy. And then the rest. OK? So now, I sort of do binomial expansion of this guy. And I know that each contribution to the binomial expansion is non-negative. 
right? So I just focus on one of the contributions. So the one contribution I'm focusing is the one where this appears with exponent 1, and this appears with exponent d minus 1. So obviously, I've forgotten uh, exponent d minus 1 here, right? Something homogeneous of degree d can't become homogeneous of degree 2 artificially. OK, so now this is ample, and this is not numerically equivalent to 0. So this number is non-zero. So as q gets bigger and bigger, it's going to go to plus infinity. Right? A and D are fixed numbers. The only, the only thing I'm allowed to change there is Q. So as I make Q bigger and bigger, this intersection number grows. This is the volume of this divisor. Sections of multiple of this divisor asymptotically behave. This is the leading coefficient of the polynomial that measures those sections. So let me write that down. Um, so H0 of E Q D minus KX minus B, just want to make sure I get the parenthesis in the right place, is greater or equal to E to the D of a D factorial to D to the D plus something that grows at most like the D minus first one power of E. Okay, so let's think about this. I'm looking at the number of sections of multiples of this big line bundle. This line bundle is nef and big because it's, and it's top self intersection. I can assume that it's as big as I want. In particular, I can assume that the top self intersection is bigger than 2D to the power of D. Maybe I should put strictly bigger. Right? It goes to infinity, so I can assume it's bigger than 2d to the d. So uh, that doesn't tell me anything about how many sections qd minus kx plus b has, but it does tell me asymptotically, as e gets bigger and bigger, how many sections that linear series has. And it's a lot. Now, vanishing at uh, x with multiplicity, uh, uh, 2dE is at most 2dE of binomial coefficient 2e d, 2dE over d conditions. So why is that? Well, you have to vanish to first order. That's just one condition. Then all first order derivatives have to vanish. So that's d conditions. Then all second order derivatives have to vanish. That's d plus 1 over 2 or d over 2, d choose 2 conditions, and so on. And you have to sum all of these coefficients. So, so the number of conditions is I'm doing the sum for i equals 0 to 2dE or 2dE minus 1. I, I don't care. I'm just trying to do the asymptotics of, um, um, uh, what is it? Is it d plus i uh, over i? Hopefully that's working. So it's supposed to be 1 plus d plus uh, uh, um, I think it's d plus 1 over 2. OK, so you're just you know, counting how many conditions it is to get the Taylor series to vanish up to that order. And if you do this summation right, you get this kind of number. And then the uh, rate of growth of this number well, you know, it's 2d e factorial divided by d factorial, 2d e minus d factorial. So the leading terms is really 2d e times 2d e minus 1, and so on, d terms of those. So the leading term is approximately 2d e to the d um, over d factorial uh, plus smaller order. OK? So I have a lot of sections. I use, my, I, I use these degrees of freedom to guarantee that I have vanishing to high order at the point. And I've worked out the numbers so that we have now proven the step. Well, I copied the numbers from somewhere so that we would have this step. So uh, I'm going to set now m of q is going to be um, uh, well, let me say, so 
we may pick um, M Q E, which is numeric equivalent or, well, in fact, linear equivalent to E Q D minus K X minus B, such that the multiplicity at X of M Q E is greater or equal, or maybe strictly greater, depending on how, to 2 DE. And then let MQ just be MQE divided by E. So then this will be now Q linear equivalent to QD minus KX minus B. And it will have multiplicity at x of mq will be greater than 2d. And hopefully that's what I promised. The linear equivalence is correct. And the multiplicity is at least two times the dimension. OK. OK, so, so we're almost there. But there is one last step. I now have to apply Kavamata v big vanishing. So, so so what we've done is we've used the fact that D is not numerically trivial to produce interesting sections. And um, you'll see in a second that we use that to, to produce an interesting non kavamata log terminal center over an appropriate pair. And then we're going to lift sections from that non kavamata log terminal center. So step three, conclusion. So bear with me, it's probably about another black, one more, one and a half blackboards, but we're almost done. So um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pick f from x prime to x, some log resolution of x b plus m e. Is it m e or m q? m q. And f will be an appropriate f exceptional divisor such that minus f is f ample. Right, so if you were just blowing up C2 at a point, you just take the exceptional divisor, or a coefficient one. Um, uh, so then I'm going to fix um, some very small number epsilon, positive but very small. And I'm going to look at t is going to be essentially along canonical pressure, the supremum of those tau's uh, with the property that x prime b prime plus um, epsilon f. In first, you can essentially ignore this epsilon f plus t. This is the important part, pullback of m. Um, uh, um, is log canonical, OK? So well, it's a log resolution, so everything inside has simple normal crossings. So you're just asking for, I'm just asking for the biggest t, for, for which t does there exist a component of this divisor whose coefficient becomes equal to 1. Right? And that, that's some kind of log canonical pressure. OK, so um, first of all, let's estimate how big is t going to be. Well, t is clearly zero, big, bigger than 0, because if I put t equals 0, x prime b prime is sub KOT plus epsilon f will stay sub KOT. So in fact, t, prime, t will be strictly greater than 0. And here I could call that tau, so there should be a tau. Okay. And it's also going to be less than two uh, than one half, because when t is equal to one half, the multiplicity at the point becomes equal to the dimension. So when you blow up that point, remember we did this computation, when you do blow up that point, the relative canonical is d minus one, but you have a contribution of d coming from this divisor. So you will get something with coefficient 1 just by blowing up the point x. 
There may be other stuff that's even worse when you pick a log resolution, but just blowing up that point. So it, it's somewhere in this interval. I think probably we, we just want it to be less than one, so. Um, okay, so if you think about, so remember A, which was QD minus KX minus B, this was ample. And so uh, the pullback of A minus epsilon F is ample. I'm trying to apply Kavamata Vivek vanishing, so I need to check some conditions. So this is going to be ample. And I'm also going to assume that this guy here has a unique uh, non-KLT center. So that means a unique uh, divisor of coefficient 1. So t is that number for which this finally gains a divisor of coefficient 1. So why can I assume that it's going to be only one divisor of coefficient 1, right? Maybe there's more than one exceptional divisor where these, these things are achieved at the same time. The point is that I have some degree of freedom in my choice of f. The only thing I required so far from f is that it is minus f is relatively ample. That's an open condition, so I can perturb the coefficients of f to tie break, to make sure that when I re reach this threshold where some divisor has coefficient 1, I don't reach two divisors at the same time. OK, so we're almost there, because now we find a special divisor. Uh, so I, I guess we can write. Um, we can write this as being E, the divisor of coefficient 1, plus delta, so where this has coefficients strictly less than 1. OK. So, OK, so now I claim uh, that H1 of M d prime minus the round down of delta minus e is equal to 0. OK, I'll check this in a second. Why, why do I want to check? I already advertised that when, when you check that you have some vanishing, that's just going to be by applying Kavamata Vivek vanishing. So suppose I can check that. Then let me look at the following short exact sequence. 0 goes to m d prime minus round down of delta minus e to m d prime minus the round down of delta to m d prime minus the round down of delta uh, restricted to e goes to 0. So if I have that vanishing, then I get subjection from h0 m d prime minus the round down of delta to h0 of m d prime minus the round down of delta restricted to e. So in order to get sections in a multiple of d prime, all I need to do is get sections here. And hopefully, I can do that by induction on dimension. OK? So we're almost there. Let me check. So I have two things to check, that I have this vanishing but I arranged everything so I'd have this vanishing. You'll see in a second. And that induction applies to E. OK, so why do I have this vanishing? It's got to be Kavamata Vivek vanishing. So this is my Cartier divisor that I want to check is KLT plus Nefan big. So let's, let's just do it. M d prime minus the round down of delta minus E is, um, I claim that this is equal to ky plus the fractional part of delta. This is my KLT gadget. Um, plus uh, the pullback of m minus tqd minus 1 plus, OK, let me write it, and then we'll check it. Kx plus b 
minus epsilon f, which is ample. OK, so let's, let's see if this crazy equation has any chance of being uh, right. So what is m delta prime minus the round down of delta minus e? OK, so delta minus e is this mess here. OK, we'll take care of that in a second. So to go from round down of delta to delta, you just need to add the fractional part of delta. OK, so md prime, so if I were to bring this bit to this side, I would be left with md prime, which is m, which is the pullback of md, minus delta minus e. Uh, so if I take this epsilon f to this other side, I'm left with, um, OK, let's minus, minus epsilon minus delta. So it's b prime plus epsilon f plus t pullback of m. OK, but the pullback of m, remember, m is numerically equivalent to qd minus kx minus b. There we go. tm, tqd minus t kx plus b. So we've taken that into account. Uh, and now we have to account for this b prime and this epsilon f. Well, the epsilon f is here. They cancel. So we have the b prime, and we have the ky. Oh, I should, this should be kx prime, of course. kx prime plus b prime, that's just the pullback of kx plus b. And here it is, pullback 1 times kx plus b. So this is usually best done in the privacy of your office, checking all of these. But I, I, I try to trace back every single bit in this equality here. And uh, it looked like I was successful. So hopefully I didn't you know, cheat anywhere. So, so if you can write something like that, then you can apply Kavamata Viva vanishing. So this claim holds. So now we need to see why induction applies to this gadget here, right? But you see md prime minus d minus round down of delta is going to be what? It's going to be ky prime plus e plus fractional part of delta restricted to e. This part is very promising because that's just ke plus fractional part of delta restricted to e, which is a Kavamata log terminal pair. OK. And then we have all of this mess here, which is just plus something ample. Um, OK. So um, we get this non-vanishing by applying the theorem. So what are we going to do? We're applying the theorem to d prime restricted to e, which is again, again going to be nef divisor. This is clearly nef. And then to the KLT pair, ke plus fractional delta restricted to e is KLT. And what does a non-vanishing theorem say? What do we have to check? Some multiple of d minus kx plus b has to be nef and big, right? Um, so some uh, so that's klt. So k epsilon plus delta restricted to e is sub klt. Uh, that's what's giving this vanishing. So the last thing we need to check is that a d prime restricted to e minus uh, k e plus delta restricted to e is nef and big. <laughs> so um, um, so we look at this equation here with m equals a, and then you just take this to the other side, and um, what you are getting is this ample device. So it does work out. Right, so if I take this to that side and restrict to e, I get uh, what I promised. 
Um, so, so essentially, we're doing the tricks that I promised with an ample divisor. You know, restrict to some divisor by having vanishing of h1, uh, for which you use Kavamata vv vanishing, and then using induction on the divisor. Uh, typically, the only way you can do that is by finding some interesting log canonical pressure. OK, so, um, so that is um, uh, a little bit of a complicated proof, but most of the proofs are in this spirit, so I did want to do, uh, I did want to do a complete proof of that. So uh, maybe we'll take a five minute break and then I will uh, uh, talk about the finiteness of minimal models. So, so far I have not really even given what the definition of a minimal model uh, is. Um, sort of, we've taken that the definition should probably be something like the output of a minimal model program, but I have not actually defined it. So let me make the following definition. So um, uh, let, let's consider XB to be maybe a KLT pair. You could assume that it's log canonical, but I'm most interested in KLT pairs. Um, and um, let's say that f from x prime to from x to x prime is um, a proper birational morphism of q factorial varieties. Proper birational of q factorial varieties. And um, uh, they don't have to be q factorial, but it, it's convenient. And let's say that F inverse uh, contracts no devices. So this is what you expect from running a minimal model program, because as we discussed, every time you flip or you contract a divisor, if you started with a Q factorial variety, it stays Q factorial. And obviously, you don't create any new divisors. You'll contract some divisors, but you don't extract any divisors. So this is the kind of map that you get from running a uh, Minimal model program. Um, uh, so now let's look. So this, um, well, I, 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 there's a name for this map. So um, uh, with this, we, we say that it is is a rational contraction. But there's more that we expect from a minimal model program, right? So 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 suppose that we take a common resolution. So take the graph of this map and take the normalization and maybe resolve that. And uh, let's call this W, say, with maps P and Q. So P and Q are rational maps. And I can compare Kx uh, uh, with the pullback of Kx prime plus B prime. So B prime will just be the push forward of B. So let me write as E the difference of these two. So we expect E to be effective, right? Because that's what happened when we do, do the zero contractions and flips. So uh, if E is greater or equal to zero, we say F is non-positive. Uh, and if E is greater or equal to zero and uh, contains the strict transformer of all uh, F exceptional divisors, then uh, we say that F is negative. So where is the name non-positive or negative coming from? Well, this is the behavior that we expect from a sequence of flips and divisor contraction. And the point is that the class for a flipping contraction, Kx plus B, is negative, is relatively anti-ample, right? So that's, that's where the name non-positive or negative is coming from. Um, so if F is negative, 
and kx prime plus b prime is nef, then this is the definition. Uh, uh, f is a minimal model. For, let me just say for kx plus b. Right, so a minimal model is a negative uh, <clears throat> birational contraction with the property that, it, you know, the output you get an F divisor. Um, if there are other, a couple of other definitions, which I might as well give because I set myself up for that. So if um, F is non-positive, and kx plus b is ample, then f is um, ample model, sometimes called a log canonical model, ample model. And, uh, and similarly, if instead of being ample is nef, then f is, a, we say it's a weak log canonical model. So the ample model, if you think about what happens when you, when you go to the canonical model, you do all your flips and divisor contractions, and at the end, you have a morphism that is, contracts all the curves that intersect kx plus b zero. That part is the part which is not necessarily negative, it's just non-positive of your morphism. So, so, so that's, that's the formal definition, and we've already seen that running a minimum model program uh, will satisfy all of these properties, right? And, and so, you know, the, the theorem, theorem is that if kx plus b is q uh, factorial uh, and pseudo-effective, remember pseudo-effective means that if you add epsilon ample, it becomes big then uh, x, uh, kx plus b has a minimum model. Can I ask a question? Yeah. How come uh, if it's long positive and the next one is ample, you don't call it long positive ample? You need to ask James. And maybe Shokurov. I'm not sure. I didn't come up with that name. I'm, I'm just... It would seem very reasonable to me that you say it's a log canonical model. But it's possible that Shokarov was using it for some slight variation. And so in spirit, it should be called? Yeah, I would call it log canonical model. If you call it log canonical model, I, I would not object. It's not, it's not immediately clear. And then if I stare at the definition, maybe there's some small thing that, uh, but in spirit, it's certainly the right. Oh, this one here? Yeah. yeah, because the map is non-positive. Yeah. So you could have like a flop or something. Uh, a flop some or contract some divisor, yes. And sometimes you want to build that in for extra flexibility. Uh, we probably will not use it, is my guess. Uh, I, I did want to remark in this case that um, uh, something nice happened that kx prime plus b prime not only is nef but is semi-ample. Right, because the point is that um, you want to apply the base point free theorem to this, right? Now, the base point free theorem says you need a nef divisor, uh, you need a KLT pair, and then you need a nef divisor d nef such that d minus kx plus b should be ample, uh, or just nef and big. Right? That's, that's how you get a semi-ample device according to the base point free theorem. Um, so we sort of have to figure out what to do. So I guess my instinct would be to take D is going to be like 2kx prime plus b prime. Uh, but I don't want to have my KLT pair be kx prime plus b prime, because if I subtract that from this, I just get something nef, not nef and big. 
So I need to perturb this B prime. So notice that B prime is Q-ring equivalent to an ample divisor plus an effector divisor. And so let's, um, let's uh, uh, by assumption, because I forgot the assumption, thank you. And B is big. Right. Remember last time we, we, we stated the theorem, when is it known that there is a minimal model? We needed to make some extra assumption, and I really stress the fact that we need, that B is big is the right condition, similar to the non-vanishing theorem, and then out of this condition I showed that you could even assume just that Kx plus B is itself big by some little trick, and then it sort of implies the non pseudo effective case as well. My apologies, I forgot that condition. Okay, so if you assume that B is big, uh, then the push forward of big is big, so B prime is also big. You can write it as ample plus effective. So now consider D minus Kx prime plus B prime plus epsilon E. This is again a KLT pair because I'm, a perturbation of a KLT pair will be KLT. But now this difference will be 1 minus epsilon Kx prime plus B prime plus epsilon A. This is nef, and this is ample. So the difference is ample, nef and big, so the base point free theorem applies. So, so under this hypothesis that B is big, then you automatically get, instead of having uh, that the minimal model, the Kx prime plus B prime is nef, it's actually semi-ample, which is very convenient. Okay, so. Um, so you're just the theorem. You haven't proved it. No, I have not proved this yet. So, so the idea for proving this is to run a minimal model program. Uh, and the idea behind that is I need to prove existence of flips and termination of flips. And I explained last time how termination of flips should follow from finiteness of uh, minimal models. So I guess what I should do now is I should state more formally what this finiteness of minimal models is and, and explain how to prove it. So let's, and luckily the statement is, uh, to be precise, is a little bit uh, um, wordy. So X is going to be a Q factorial projective pair. A is going to be some ample Q divisor. C contained in the space of R divisors on X is going to be a, a, a rational polytope. So I really mean you have finitely many rational points and you're just taking convex linear combination of those finitely many rational points. This is an infinite dimensional vector space, but I'm, I'm really thinking of a finite dimensional subspace and a rational polytope in there. Now, um, I want the that the following is true. For any one of these uh, R divisors, if you don't uh, like R divisors, just think of Q divisors. Um, I want to know that Kx plus B is Kavamata log terminal. <coughs> then I claim uh, then there exists uh, finitely many uh, proper rational maps. Uh, so there exists, well, let's just write it, finitely many proper uh, rational contractions. Rational contractions. Say phi i from x to xi where i is between 1 and k. Such that if b is in this polytope and uh, kx plus b plus a is pseudo-effective, then 
So the first thing is that phi i is a minimal model. For some, uh, right? So, so um, there's finitely many choices of these uh, maps that will give you a minimal model. You know, one of them will work. At least one of them will work for each and every divisor in this finite-dimensional polytope. And two, uh, if you have a minimal model. for let's say x, b plus a, where b is in c, uh, then uh, phi i composed with phi inverse uh, is an isomorphism uh, for some. So, so these guys here really cover all possible minimal models. For every B and C, they give you a minimal model. And for any minimal model, for some B and C, one of these PIs is, is that minimal model. In particular, if you just think of one pair, uh, the fact that I have this ample device in the picture, really just think of it meaning as the boundary is big, tells you that there are finally many minimal models. OK. so. Um, OK, so the way, so first of all, any questions on the statement? Is there anything that's confusing about the statement? Is, is now key, key is big, you don't need key. Oh, OK, so, so maybe, maybe what I've done uh, is I've implemented this trick somehow. So whenever you have a big boundary, you can sort of uh, uh, um, rewrite the boundary as effective plus ample, and you can assume that the boundary contains an ample divisor. And since this, this is a finite dimensional rational polytope, you can sort of do it uniformly for all the points of this polytope. I'm not going to worry about that technical part of the proof. There's many little technical parts of the proofs that work that way. So, so again, the idea is that if B is big, so we know that B is Q linear equivalent to ample plus effective, then KX plus B is Q linear equivalent to KX plus 1 minus epsilon B uh, plus epsilon E plus epsilon ample. This is again KLT, and now I have ample in the picture. But since they're numerically equivalent, Running a minimal model program for this guy is exactly the same as running a minimal model program for that guy. So essentially, if you have two numerically equivalent gadgets, you can't really tell the minimal models apart because everything you do is sort of numerical. Well, at least the boundary is big. So, yeah. okay. So, so, so you know, this is one technical issue that I'm sweeping under the rug. Uh, OK, so what I'd like to do now is, well, if we call this theorem A, and we call this theorem B, then the claim is that theorem A implies theorem B. And actually, I'm going to just worry about proving the first part. The second part is similar. Okay. So um, we do induction on the dimension of C. Uh, if the dimension of C is equal to 0, then a polytope, zero dimensional polytope is just a point. That G means I'm just wondering about one boundary, one big boundary. And then I'm just asking that there, are, there is a minimal model. That's all I'm asking for. So this one is automatically satisfied. This is just the content of theorem A. OK, so now 
I'm working by induction on dimension C. So the idea is that if this is your polytope, then uh, what you want to show is somehow that if you, if, you, uh, if you can solve the problem for the boundary of your polytope, then you can solve it for the whole polytope, sort of by uh, taking convex linear combinations. Okay, so let's see how that works. Of course, it's not that easy. Um, now, okay, so now C intersect the pseudo-effective cone is compact. Right, so it's closed and it's bounded, so it's compact. So I can prove the theorem uh, locally around some boundary B0 in C. Right, so if you, can, if you can prove the problem locally, then finitely many open subsets will cover your compact set. And for each of these finitely many open subsets, you have finitely many of these rational maps. So altogether, there's finitely many rational maps. So OK, so, so the picture is more like this is my big polytope C. And I pick my B0, and I just want to prove it locally around B0. OK. OK, so first step, um, you may assume that Kx plus B0 plus A is a uh, net. Well, and KLT, of course, but that's what I'm. Uh, emphasizing here. Okay, well, so you may say, well, of course you can assume it's NAF because we're assuming theorem A, so we know that it has a minimal model, right? But the question is not, does this have a minimal model? The question is, in order to prove the, the theorem, can I assume that I started with this having a minimal model? Okay, so let's see how that works. Um, so by theorem A, there exists a minimal model, phi from x to x prime, which is a minimal model for kx uh, plus b0 plus a. OK, so what does that do to nearby pairs, right? So um, this is part of a minimal model program for kx plus b plus a if b minus b0 is small. So think of this as being the soup norm on this finite dimensional vector space. So I'm just saying if the coefficients of b are very close to the coefficients of b0, then I claim that every flip and every divisorial contraction for kx plus b0 plus a is also a flip or a divisor contraction for kx plus b plus a, right? Because being a flip, you just check it, is the intersection with a given curve negative? Well, that's an open condition, right? So it will be true on a small neighborhood. Same thing for a divisor contraction. So uh, just assuming that this map is obtained by a finite sequence of flips and divisor contractions, then uh, they will also be flips and divisor contraction for a small neighborhood of b0. So, right, so it's part of a minimal model program. So I'm not done with showing that everything in this polytope has a minimal model, but I have taken a step in the right direction, right? So, so if uh, now kx prime plus b prime plus a prime, the push forward here, has a minimal model, then so does kx plus b plus a. Right, so if, if you prefer perform a few flips and divisor contraction for kx plus b plus a, and then you perform a few more, the output is still a minimal model program. You've just split it up into two parts. Does that make sense? 
Sorry? No, I don't know. What is B prime and this point? So B prime is this other boundary in a small neighborhood of B0. Oh, I see. So uh, if I pick the neighborhood small, the first going to the X prime doesn't do anything bad to the B prime. It's just a partial minimum model program. And then I need to complete the minimum model program by doing more flips and divisor contractions. OK, so, okay, so now how does this, this um, um, help us? Um, OK, so, so in order not to make the notation too cumbersome, let's assume that kx plus b0 plus a is nef, and hence semi-ample. Right? I just discussed that it will be semi-ample because when b is big and you have a minimal model, it's automatically semi-ample. So, so we have, in fact, uh, a morphism. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll say it the following way. Step two, we may assume that kx plus b0 plus a is numerically equivalent to zero. So how does this work? Oh, wait, 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 wait. Chris, I, I'm sorry. I'm lost a little bit with uh, step one. No problem. Uh, so I thought we were proving the finite. Oh, oh, there exists a minimum model. That's what we are proving. Sorry. Right, yeah. So, so I need to show, I need to show, certainly I know that I have a minimum model for any boundary that I pick. I need to show that for all nearby boundaries, I also have a minimal model. So going to the minimal model of my favorite guy is not a problem because it's just a partial step in the right direction for the other ones. Now I want to use the fact that I know that kx plus b0 is nef. So in particular, it's semi-ample. But we are proving only one, number one. Yes, and I'm proving over number, only number one. So I'm not worrying about all possible. I just want to show that each boundary has a. No problem, no problem. So we may assume that kx plus b0 is numerically equivalent to 0. Why is that, right? Since it's semi-ample, what does it mean that it's semi-ample? It means that there is a morphism, uh, maybe f is the, let's call it g, from x to some z, uh, such that kx plus b0 plus a is the pullback of an ample divisor h. OK, so. Um, OK, so let me um, um, state it right. So what I, what I want to say is um, um, the following. So if um, b minus b0 is sufficiently small, which is what I'm assuming. I'm working in a small neighborhood of b0. Uh, then um, a kx plus b plus a minimal model over z is a kx plus b plus a minimal model. Let's try and see if we believe this. Right, and, and, and clearly, K, by definition of z, kx plus b0 plus a is trivial over z. So the picture is the following. x goes to z. You run a minimum model program, x prime over z, and you now have that kx prime plus b prime plus a prime is nef over z, you would like to conclude, what I'm claiming is that if b prime is sufficient close to b0, that in fact, kx prime plus b prime plus a prime is nef, period, you know, over spec z. OK, so how could this possibly 
uh, um, go. Um, so um, the the way you want to think about it is the following. Uh, this, um, well, I should probably look at my notes to see how I, I wrote it down. OK, so let's assume it's not. Suppose not. Um, then um, we have that kx prime plus b prime plus a prime intersects some curve negatively. Right? That's what it means to fail to be neph. OK, but since it's neph over z, this curve c maps to curve c sub z in here. Right? It doesn't get contracted by this method. OK, now uh, there's a theorem that we haven't done, which says that uh, uh, you can, when you have negative extremal rays, you can always find them uh, with sort of uh, the, the um, intersection with respect to the corresponding Kamamata log terminal pair is never too big. So we can assume that this is, it's negative, but it's at most minus uh, twice the dimension of x. OK, so now I am going to consider um, the following. Um, let me consider um, kx plus b0 plus t b minus b0 plus a dot c. So this will be the same as. Um, One minus t h dot c. Did I say it's a, a pullback of h? Yes, uh, back of h dot c uh, plus t times k x plus b plus a dot c um, primes here. Yeah. Okay. So what am I doing here? Here's my b zero. Here's my neighborhood. I have some b in the neighborhood, let's say on the boundary here. And I found my relative minimal model, but things didn't quite work out. It intersects negatively. OK. I now look at a convex linear combination of the two. So instead of now focusing on, uh, on b prime, I'm focusing on uh, some intermediate point in the, on this ray, right? I'm doing a convex linear combination. I guess I'm taking 1 minus t b0 and t b prime here. And um, this number here is definitely positive because the curve is not contracted. And this number here is negative, but it's not too bad. It's greater or equal to, to minus 2t dimension of z. Okay? So let's assume for simplicity that h is cut here. h cut here. Then that tells me that um, as long um, as uh, 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 Sorry. here. G upper star of H, right? So, 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 um, one minus uh, kx prime plus b zero prime is pullback of ample from here. So that's why that part has to intersect the curve, not negatively. So, so now if, if if t is less than one over two uh, dimension of z, dimension of x, I'm assuming H is Cartier. In practice, maybe. OK, let's say that kh is cut here. Then I just put k here. Uh, then uh, this whole quantity is greater or equal to 0. So what am I saying? What I'm saying is it could happen, the way I've set things up, it could happen that when, uh, when I find the minimal model over z, it's not actually an honest minimal model. But if I shrink to a smaller neighborhood, uh, 
So if I shrink things down by a factor of k dimension of x over 2, uh, actually it's k2 dimension of x, by some finite factor, then it will be uh, a minimal model. So in this process, to achieve this, I have to shrink things down. I have to think about the smaller neighborhood again. But now we're done. So conclusion. Again, I want to think about this. This might be 0. Here's b. And here is any pointer between theta. Uh, which I want is a convex linear combination of those uh, two. So, um, uh, so by induction on the dimension of C, I have uh, finitely many min uh, finitely many minimum models. Uh, when B belongs to the boundary of C. OK, so now what do I do in general? So if I have any other point inside here, then I can say, well, theta minus B0 is just a multiple of B minus B0, where this multiple is going to be less than 1. OK, so now. Notice that, um, uh, let's do it this way, lambda kx plus b plus a is the same as numerically equivalent to lambda kx plus b plus uh, a plus 1 minus lambda. Yes, I'm now done with step two. I can assume that I'm working over z, and so that uh, kx plus b0 plus a is actually q linear equivalent to 0, not even linear equivalent to 0. But over z. Over z. Over z. And I'm looking for minimum models over z. Okay. And I thought you were just proving number one with distance. Right. But a similar method will get you everything if you, if you no, 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 no. I'm just, I'm just assuming the existence of minimal models. But then by induction on the bedrooms, you have finitely many. Right. So what I, what I mean by this is, uh, so for uh, exist phi 1 through phi k such that if b is in the boundary of c, then phi i is a uh, minimal model for kx plus b plus a. OK? So, so pre pretending lower dimension, we should prove 1 and 2, even though we are proving 1. Uh, I'm not sure if you're Well, I'm just focusing on 1. But if you play your cards right, you can also do 2. I just want to focus on 1. Okay. So I just, want to I just want to find enough minimal models. I'm not, not saying that I find them all. So I need to show you now that if I pick a random theta, I can, uh, one of those minimal models also works for theta. Well, which one? Well, I, I had B0, which now kx plus B0 plus A is numerically equivalent to 0. I take the ray joining with the boundary. It's got to be that one. What other thing can it be? So now I'm going to write theta essentially as a linear combination of these two. Right, so that's what I'm doing. Right, so, so now r running a minimum model program for, for um, uh, uh, so this is the same as kx plus theta plus a. Okay, so now running a minimum model program for kx plus theta plus a is the same as running it for lambda times kx plus b plus a, and hence for kx plus b plus a, right? Because something is a flip if and only if the intersection is negative. You don't care if you're multiplying it by uh, uh, a non uh, positive number. 
So B zero. Yeah, this one is zero. So this one is numerically equivalent to a multiple of that. Hence, any flip or divisorial contraction with respect to this pair is a flip and a divisorial contraction to this pair. If this guy becomes nef, this guy is also nef. I see. And so uh, you're done. Yes. So so that's that's. Uh, shows you that for any point, locally around that point, you can find, find any many modules. And then by compactness argument, you can do it for everything. Uh, it also shows you that you have to worry about R divisors, not just about Q divisors, because if you're going to do a compactness argument, you get into trouble if you don't have uh, R divisors. Uh, so you know everything I've said works for R divisors as well with minor modifications. Um, and um, and so that's, um, that's the main idea behind uh, why finiteness of models. Uh, you can then apply it to show termination of uh, uh, flips with scaling. Okay, so um, today I have not forgotten we're supposed to end at 4.45, and it's two minutes early, so uh, to make up for last time, I'll finish two minutes early. <laughs> Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.